Okay, welcome back to another creator chat here at the Comic Lounge. Today I have one of my favorite creators of all time. I have the amazing Mike Grell. You know him from his work at Marvel, DC, from everywhere. He's done everything. He's done indies and uh, Green Arrow Longbow Hunter is one of my all-time favorite DC stories. He, co he created the Warlord as well. Um, I mean, this guy's a legend, you know. I mean, he's been, he's been done it all. So welcome, Mike. Hey, Ryan. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, so first off, uh, I just want to ask, how, how have you been doing these past few months? I know things have been absolutely insane, in this, especially in this country alone. How have you been holding up? It has been absolute nuts. Uh, <laughs> we, went, we went from uh, spending anywhere from, I, I think an average month for us was three shows, three conventions. Um, sometimes we had five weeks in a row uh you know with, without a single break so when someone would ask me where do you live i'd say the airport or the high <laughs> one or two in between because we'd we'd fly out on a thursday for a three for a three-day show fly back on monday sleep in tuesday wednesday do your laundry repack your bags and fly out again on thursday it was just absolute insanity and it's been actually quite interesting um, being stable for a change, uh, relaxing on the one hand and nerve wracking on the other because, you know, with your income uh, cut into, you know, maybe 40% of what an average year had been like, uh, it, gets, it gets a little tense from time to time. Uh, Health-wise, we're holding up. I, I suspect that Mary and I both had uh, a milder uh, case of the, the COVID uh, early on because um, we, we had uh, some of the milder symptoms like gastric stuff, uh, fortunately not the respiratory that puts people in the hospital in a coma. Um, and there have been um, members of her family uh, of related members who have had the COVID and um, mm -hmm. thank God everybody's recovered. So uh, crossing fingers and toes. Um, people ask me all the time if I'm going back on the road, if I'm going to be doing uh, conventions again. The answer is yes, I have some commitments that I intend to honor that I made before the, the virus hit. But by the same time, we're not going to be silly or, or reckless about it. Um, right. Yeah, our, our idea is to sit tight until after the first of the year before we make any more commitments, and we'll see what happens. Uh, certainly not until we get a proven viable vaccine that we know is going to protect us uh, when we travel. Because yeah. life, life's short enough as it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you got, you got to be safe, definitely, especially going to, yeah. to that like kind of atmosphere where there is so many people and so like how do you protect the creators you know i've heard people some like say well why don't they put like plexiglass in front of the creators and i'm like i just don't know what's happening you know what i mean like that's like very it's not cost effective then who does that fall on does that fall on the creator does that fall on the convention people so yeah i think the best thing to do is just um at this point hold off on like for the people doing the conventions and creators like until it's safe Everything just needs right. to be put on hold, you know. Glad Absolutely. to hear you're doing okay, though. Yeah, we were we were uh, in Chicago for C two E two at the McCormick Center the day before they canceled all future events at McCormick Center. They had wow. ninety three thousand people in that place, and the outbreak had already hit Chicago. And there were people walking past us that were coughing up a lung. Um, oh, man. But you know it's Chicago, so you know winter time. <laughs> you kind of, you kind of expect some some things like that. But then when you see what what the uh, further development was, it gets a little on the scary side. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Um, it's crazy. It is it is a crazy world we're living in. But uh, let's talk about something positive. Let's talk about some comic books. Uh, I like to ask everybody that that comes on the show how they first got into comic books. What some of their first were. Um, so I'd like love to hear what some of your first comic books were. 
my my first comic book work was actually um, on an Aquaman story, but how I got into that, how I got that job was uh, pretty interesting. I was um, I was a big fan of comic strips, and I was trying like crazy to sell a comic strip. I had two of them that I had begun. One was called Iron Mike, about a hard-boiled private detective, Mickey Spillane type character. And the other was uh, called Savage Empire. And um, in 73, I went out to the New York Comic Con expecting to see all kinds of different people meet with editors and publishers and uh, be able to pitch my comic strip and get somebody to sign me to the standard rich and famous contract, which uh, didn't happen. Not only did I find that the the uh, market for adventure comic strips was completely dead. I couldn't even get an appointment to talk to an editor. They didn't want to take, they didn't want to talk to me at all. So while I was at uh, uh, the New York Comic Con, that was the old Phil Suling show. Um, and uh, I, uh, I met with um, Saul Harrison, who was publisher at DC at the time he was reviewing portfolios. And I left him a copy of my Savage Empire comic strip. Uh, I had uh, six weeks of Sundays and um, uh, two weeks of dailies and a complete synopsis for it in a big folder portfolio. And as I'm turning away from the table, uh, an older gentleman stopped me. And by older, I mean... He was probably 20 years younger than I am right now, uh, um, <laughs> but 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 he was but he was a, so this creaky old guy. Uh, by I'm 26 at the time, right? So so he was twice my age. Um, stops me and says, I, "I see you left a portfolio with Saul. Do you mind if I take a look?" So I opened it up and showed it to him, and he said, "You need to get your carcass over to Julie Schwartz's office and talk to him." And when I eventually did, I, at first I said, uh, can I tell him who sent me? Expecting to hear, you know, tell him Groucho sent you or something like that. And he said, tell him Irv. Okay. Uh, it turned out it was Irv Novick, who was the Batman artist at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I walk into Julie's office cold with my prepared encyclopedia salesman speech. You know, the one that goes, good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. Can I interest you in this deluxe 37 volume set of Encyclopedia Britannica complete with annual yearbook and calendar. And I got as far as good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. You know, if, if you get interrupted, you have to go all the way back to the beginning, right? I get as far as good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. And Julie says, what the hell makes you think you can draw comics? And I unzip my portfolio and put it on his desk. And I said, take a look and you tell me. And he flipped through the pages and he said, excuse me for a second. And he went next door and got Joe Orlando. And Joe came in, took a look at my portfolio. And I walked out uh, half an hour later with a script from Joe for the uh, Aquaman story. Uh, mm -hmm. As the Undersea City Sleeps by Steve Skates that appeared in um, Adventure Comics 439 uh, and it was it was amazing I mean it was not long seven pages I did it over the pencils over the weekend and then I, I uh, took the inks home and when I brought those in and delivered them um, Joe said uh, said right away he said I think I can get you some more money which is great you know I got forty two dollars and fifty cents a page as opposed to just the 40 bucks that I was going to get. And uh, when I got home, the phone was ringing and it was Joe. And he said, look, do you think you can handle a monthly book? And I said, sure. He said, well, Murray Boltonoff is on vacation and he doesn't know it yet, but Dave Cockrum just walked off the Legion of Superheroes. Would you mind if I recommend you for the job? Would I mind? You know, here I'd, I packed up my then wife and our dog in our exploding pinto and moved to new york on the on the come 
you know, I was dead bang certain that I was going to get hired because why not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was like the bumble, the bumblebee who never read the book. I didn't realize uh, how uh, ridiculous and impractical that was at the time, but I was just convinced that I'd be able to do it. And uh, so I did an audition uh, story for Murray uh, inking over Dave Cockrum's pencils. And uh, when I turned him in, he goes down the hall with him, comes back a few minutes later and says, okay, I've got good news and bad news. I said, well, what's the good news? And he said, you got the job. Great. What's the bad news? He says, you can expect to get hate mail. And I went, I, have, I haven't done anything yet. I didn't yeah. even have anything in print yet, right? He said, it doesn't matter. For starters, you're replacing the most popular artist we ever had on the book, Dave Cockrum. And to top things off, we're going to kill off one of the fans' favorite characters in your first issue. And he was right. He was like, ah, oh, Grell, you suck. Bring back Cocker. What happened to Dave? We want Dave. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's how that started. And uh, for the uh, most of the next year, uh, I did every job that came down the pipe. Um, people wondered how come I sort of exploded on the scene with so much product out there on the market all at once. And it was because I was workaholic. I, I would work that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright schedule. You know, he was famous for of cat napping, right? Mm -hmm. Work until you drop and then take a cat nap, get up and work until you drop again. And uh, that, that first year, I imagine I averaged, averaged 100 hours a week at the drawing board. And uh, as a reward for my efforts, I, uh, I, I earned uh, about $2,000 more than a New York policeman made and about $5,000 less than a New York garbage man made. <laughs> Which, yeah, priorities, right? That, that, that's where uh, all of that got started. And then um, with respect to uh, the warlord, how that came about, because I know that's going to be your next question, uh, right, is uh, uh, word came down that uh, Atlas Comics was uh, hiring, they were looking for creators for new properties, and they were offering $100 a page, which is 60 bucks more than I was making, um, and creator ownership, which was unheard of. Um, so I went over there and I pitched them by Savage Emperor, Empire comic strip, which is a story about uh, an archaeologist who falls through a time warp and finds himself back in Atlantis before it sank. And um, the editor, a uh, fellow by the name of Jeff Rovin, went for it big time. He said, great, we want to do this. And I said, okay, here's the thing. I have a commitment to DC Comics. I'm doing this book for them. I was doing Legion of Superheroes at the time. And I want to show them that this is not going to interfere with them. Uh, give me a chance to get two issues in the can before you announce. And he said, sure, no problem. So I left Jeff Rovin's office and walked across town to DC, 20 minutes. Carmine Infantino was waiting for me in the lobby. and. It turns out that Jeff Rovin had picked up the telephone as soon as I walked out the door to brag to Carmine. He said, I got your boy Grell tied up. And Carmine, uh, always regarded as somewhere between Don Corleone and the Pope, the difference being that with the Pope, you only have to kiss his ring, right? And he, uh, <laughs> said, he said, why didn't you bring it to us? And I, I said, well, for starters, you guys haven't had a really great track record with sword and sorcery, fantasy kind of stuff, which is true. And number two, I said, they're offering $100 a page in creator ownership. And Carmine said, look, I can't give you creator ownership. We don't do that. But what I can do is give you top rate, which at that time was $62.50 which was, you know, 20 bucks more a page than I was getting uh, at the moment. 
and I'll give you a guaranteed one year run. He said, that's probably better than you would get from Atlas because they're most likely that they'll last about six months and disappear. He was right there. Uh, not only that, but Atlas's promise of creator ownership and a hundred dollars a page was written on the wind. Um, none of the guys who did their books for Atlas wound up owning their properties. And as soon as they got, uh, I think it was two issues or three issues in the can from the original creators, they fired them and hired foreign artists who would work for 25 bucks a page. And the, you know, so that's, that was that. And um, I went on to do um, uh, the warlord writing and drawing and uh, <laughs> funny story. I, I walk in when the lettering page, lettered pages were due uh, for the uh, for the issue number three, we relaunched it with first issue special number eight, and and uh, ran three issues of the regular book. And when I was reading lettered pages, proofreading, I I come to the last page and it says the end, and I said to Joe, it's not supposed to say the end; it's supposed to say next issue, and then the title of the next issue, and. Uh, uh, Joe said, yeah, well, Carmine canceled the book. I said, you can't do that. He promised me a year's run. And Joe said, he lied. He does that. <laughs> and so there I was, uh, uh, screwed 16 ways till Sunday, except that within about three weeks, uh, Jeanette Kahn walked in and canceled Carmine Infantino. And uh, Jeanette, who is a very astute lady, she knew everything inside and out about the company long before she took over. Right. And um, first thing she did was ask for the, uh, the publishing schedule and she looked through it and said, where's the warlord? Turns out it was her favorite book. And uh, they said, Carmine canceled it. And she said, Carmine's not here anymore. Put it back. So there was a hiccup. It was running bi-monthly at the time but it wasn't much of a hiccup. Um, and and it, it went right back to the publishing schedule again. The the capper to that whole uh, secret origin of Mike Grell as a cartoonist story is that several years later, I was in my studio in Wisconsin and a package comes in the mail and it had DC's return stamp on it, the return address. And I didn't remember sending them anything recently. It was heavy and it was about so big like this. Hands like you can see them bigger than my screen will allow. At any rate, I, I open it up and there's my Savage Empire portfolio accompanied by a form letter rejection slip from DC Comics that read. <laughs> and and I, re I remember this. Dear artist, thank you for your submission. Unfortunately, it doesn't meet our current publishing uh, requirements. Thank you very much. Uh, best of luck, DC Comics editorial staff. And the hysterical part was at that moment, The Warlord was the best selling book that they had, which was based on that. Because what happened is that when I went into uh, Carmine's office to pitch it, to pitch uh, Savage Empire, the telephone was ringing and uh, Carmine excused himself to take the call just for a few minutes. And in that brief gap, my brain finally kicked in and said, you know, dummy, if he buys this, you lose it. It's There's no creator ownership. Mm -hmm. So you know, but during his three minute phone call, I chucked out the story about the, the uh, archeologist in Atlantis and it became the story of an SR-71 spy pilot uh, who uh, winds up in the world at the center of the earth. I, I just read the book, of The Hollow Earth, uh, one of many, many that were, had been written on that subject. Um, and I drew on everything you could possibly imagine. When, when he said, so what's the name of this world? I said, Scartaris, right off the bat. Because uh, in the... Jules Verne book, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. 
Scartaris is the name of the mountain peak that points the way to the passageway inside the volcano that leads down into the center of the earth. Uh, and uh, he said, so uh, what's the name of this city? And I said, it's Shambhala, because three dog night, right? Mm-hmm. How does your light shine on the road to Shambhala? Well, Shambhala was the, the golden city that is supposed to be somewhere underground in the mountains of Tibet. So I had all of that going for me. Um, I drew on my Air Force background, uh, knowledge of uh, certain things that uh, weren't generally common public knowledge at the time. Um, I I worked with guys who had associations with the SR-71, and I had access to all of that material while I was in the Air Force. So I I basically pulled stuff out of my hat and other orifices and um, BS my way through the pitch session. And I got as far as Joe Orlando when uh, uh, Carmine said, pitch it to Joe. And if Joe likes it, I'll give you that year's run. And Joe had the one question that was a stumper for me. He said, what's this guy's name? Well, I didn't want to use up the names that I had in Savage Empire. So I said, uh, Morgan. And he says, Morgan what? I said, Morgan the Raider, you know, like Henry Morgan, the pirate. He says, well, what's his first name? And I said, Henry, of course. And he said, no, can't do that because there's two actors using the name Henry Morgan. One was a comedian. The other one was Harry Morgan, um, who was on uh, Dragnet, eventually went to MASH, right? So uh, reaching into my uh, bag of tricks again, my brother had just had a baby boy, and he named him Travis. And that's where the Travis came from. Uh, By the way, my nephew Travis is now married to a lady named Jennifer, who's and but but that was long long after I had created the the Jennifer character in the world. So all of that, you know, fortuitous circumstances, being at the right place at the right time. Um, it's it's. I think they used to say that it's better to be lucky than smart, or better to be lucky than good. I just happened to be at the right place at exactly the right moment, and you know, as far as the the, the drawing itself goes, um, my style was something that was in vogue at the time. And mm-hmm. if, I, if I were trying to get into the business today, I'd probably have a tough time of it. Just like Jack Kirby told me that, you know, if he had come along uh, 30 years or 40 years later, he probably would have been able to get through the door. You know, we all sort of feel that way about our, our, our artwork. You have to keep challenging yourself. That's all there is to it. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I personally, I love the Warlord character. I like that, um, you know, we don't see that genre in, in comics like I would like to see, like that fantasy adventure type story. And I know you kind of closed the chapter on Travis Morgan, but is there is is there any, like, thoughts in your head of maybe revisiting? I mean, we kind of saw him recently in Young Justice the character appeared in there. I know you did a cover for um, that as well. So what's yes. the chances of... Uh... Uh, it, it's comics. It's hard to keep a good man dead. <laughs> uh, and, and, and yes, yes, I, I had a plan going in when I killed him, okay? Um, I, actually, I've, I always planned to kill him off. I always planned that. From the time in the first issue special number eight i was drawing the the panel where morgan gives tara his wristwatch and she puts it on her arm like a a bangle on her arm and as i was drawing that panel i figured out how he was going to die who was going to kill him and why and what part that wristwatch was going to play in the whole storyline and i was so glad that i was able to persuade the powers that be to let me do that story. Um, I was I was always a big fan of uh, Prince Valiant and Hal Foster. And uh, Foster's one regret was that the syndicate wouldn't let him kill, kill off Prince Valiant. He always intended 
to kill him off after the first year or so and then hand it over to his son. And by then the the character had become so popular the the syndicate went, oh no, 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 no. You might as well kill Superman or Tarzan, right? So um I've for the 35th anniversary, I was able to go back and do that story and um again hand over to his son. But yes, I it, as I was writing that and patting myself on the back uh, for the, the little bit where I burned the body, I already figured out how to do it so it'll work in correctly and you can bring him back. And I'm hoping that for the 50th anniversary, which is coming up before you know it, it would be just three years from now. Um, I'm certainly going to be around and hopefully DC Comics will allow me the chance to come back and uh, reboot that character, revisit that, that, that story again, because it is one of my favorites. Um, what I, what I liked about it was that it gave me the flexibility to go anywhere and do anything. Uh, it's a world where the dinosaurs never died out because no ice age, right? Um, science fiction because the, the, the world was settled by um, descendants of the Atlanteans who then elevated themselves once again to this high level before blowing themselves up and leaving behind a world where it's, it's full of these strange machines and contraptions that still work, but the people don't understand how to use it. Uh, it would be like, you know, if, uh, if, uh, uh, ancestors of ours uh, stumble across a, um, an automobile um, 3,000 years from now and somehow it still works. You know, you don't understand how it works. Or in fact, uh, to this day, uh, present day, nobody under, really understands how a car works anymore. When I was a kid, you could open the, the hood of a car and, and look at it and go, I can figure this out. I understand how this works. Right now, I open the hood of a car. There's nothing in there that looks anything like an engine that I'm familiar <laughs> with. And it just close it back up again. Most people know, you know, key, steering wheel, brake, gas. And if you're from New York, the horn. That's about it. And, and nothing else. So um, that, that concept of... of uh, uh, people using technology or living among technology that they don't understand was uh, kind of fun there. And I made it a, a strict point never, ever to draw a map. Everybody, every month we'd get a request, draw a map, draw a map, draw a map. I said, no, because if you draw a map, you set limits, you establish boundaries. And right away somebody is going to want to know how could the warlord be in desert country one issue and the very next issue he's on the other side of the world in snow country it's it you don't need to know that it's not that important it's the the, the story itself is important but those kind of details just get in the road and anyway who would want to put a boundary on imagination I do want to, I hope, first of all, I hope that that happens for the 50th anniversary. I know there's a lot, a lot of people that I'm sure are also fans of the Warlord would love that. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, Green Arrow Longbow Hunters. That is the book that I discovered when I was younger that, that you, that was my first introduction to your work. And it, it started off my obsession with Green Arrow and became why he was one of my favorite characters. You, it probably would have been cheaper for you if I had just taken you out and bought you some crack. <laughs> um, you know, I was I, I was wondering what inspired because you took him in a completely different di direction than than he was in prior to that. What inspired the urban hunter version of this character? I it's it's real easy. Um, when I first started drawing the Green Arrow stories in backup in action comics, um, it was straight superhero stuff, but following the footsteps of what uh, Denny, Denny O'Neill 
had done in the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series. Um, the, in actuality, the, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow books were what got me interested in comics again. Uh, when I was in Saigon, um, a fellow came from the States carrying a dozen copies of his favorite comic books. And, and among those were some of the Green Lantern, Green Arrow books. And I was flabbergasted. I, I had gotten away from reading comics about the time I got seriously interested in girls. And so the, the uh, result was that I, you know, I emulated Neil Adams' style as closely as I could. And that was, that was actually more common than folks realize at, at the time. Um, every generation, every decade has their stylistic art that sort of puts the stamp on it. The, the 50s were certainly, uh, 40s and 50s were certainly dominated by Jack Kirby. The 60s were um, guys like Carmine Infantino, Gil Kane, um, uh, John Buscema, John Romita, um, and, and folks uh, of that nature. The, the 70s, when I broke in, Neil's style was the style, more illustrative, more, um, uh, more realistic than uh, what we had been familiar with seeing. And, you know, um, carrying on, I mean, John Byrne dominated the 80s, uh, the 90s with Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee and guys like that. And in the 2000s, it seems to be almost anybody who can either draw anime or trace a photograph, you know, it's one, one, of, those, one of those things. But that, that, was all, that was all a part of what interested me in the character in the first place. Plus, ever since I was a little kid, Green Arrow was my favorite comic book character. He's Robin Hood, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I learned to shoot a bow when I was about four years old. And uh, you know, I, could, I could put an arrow on, on the string and pull it back maybe three or four inches and launch it all of six feet. And to me, that was just great fun. Uh, so I shot a bow from, from the time I was just a little kid. and then. Um, Denny's run on Green Lantern, Green Arrow uh, impressed me. Uh, I, I still liked the Green Arrow character better than Green Lantern, but the two were partners, and they played off each other extremely well. With Green Lantern, you have the sheriff. He's the letter of the law. He's upholding, upholding the letter of the law. And with Green Arrow, he's Robin Hood. He's more the spirit of justice. Um, so, um, after I had broken away from DC to go on and, and do independent comics like Star Slayer and John Sable Freelance, um, I get a phone call from Mike Gold, who had been my editor on John Sable. And uh, Gold said, uh, look, is there any character over here that you like well enough to bury the hatchet and come back to work? And I, I said, and, and it was truthful, I said, I always felt that I had done such a crappy job on Batman in the 70s that I'd love to get another shot at that. But I had just had a dinner with Frank Miller uh, maybe a week or so before. And Frank uh, laid out his concept for The Dark Knight. And... I said, when Frank's done with the Dark Knight, you can put a period at the end of the Batman sentence for the next 20 years. Well, here we are 30 odd years later and still counting. You know, I was off by that much. But um, Gold said, well, what about Green Arrow? And I said, Green Arrow has always been my favorite comic character. And he said, think about this, Green Arrow as an urban hunter. And that's what sparked the entire thing. Now, uh, Mike is a real savvy guy and he knew exactly how to jerk my chain to get exactly the response he wanted. And I asked him, you know, first, uh, will I be able to do the kinds of stories that I want to do? And he said, absolutely. A carte blanche, uh, do what you want. And I, I said, okay, well, first thing that's got to change is I want to take him out of the mythical star city and put him in the real world. 
and um, in in order to do that, uh, I mean that that change brought about other changes. Um, putting him in Seattle, uh, the reason the reason for Seattle as a choice was I was living there at the time. Uh, but I'm a, a small town guy. I grew up in a, a town that I think the current population is about 450 people, 100 miles north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. I've only ever lived in or around three cities, three major cities in my life up until that point. And that was Chicago, where I went to art school, New York, which I had already used as a setting for Sable, and Seattle. And you have to know what you're talking about uh, if you're going to uh, set something in the real world. Seattle had a lot of really cool stuff going for it. Um, uh, not just a, a very diverse uh, population. Culturally, um, has everything. Great music scene, I mean, uh, a terrific food. And uh, geographically, it's in a great spot in the world. Um, Except there on the coast that is close to Canada, um, close to uh, uh, it, it's got it's got everything. It's got everything from uh, uh, high desert to mountains to the ocean to lakes and rivers and everything you could possibly want. Uh, and it also had this great building up on Capitol Hill that I I, I uh, drew a turret on the thing, but everything else is real. Uh, and I called it Sherwood Florist. The the change, because it, he's in Seattle, I had to change the costume uh, because it rains a hell of a lot in Seattle, generally speaking. I mean, there's a real good reason why the, their Labor Day celebration is called Bumper Shoot. It, it usually starts raining around the 1st of September and continues like that for sometimes into May or even early June, one year I didn't even uh, get my bicycle out of storage and uh, excuse me, my, my motorcycle out of storage until uh, the end of June. It was th that nasty all year long. So the hood went off, and then the uh, the costume got um, sleeves, proper sleeves to keep your arms warm and dry, proper trousers and. Uh, what I also did was I kept the color combinations the same because I didn't want some reader to pick it up and not be able to identify the character. Like who's this guy in a purple outfit with, you know, uh, a, a green arrow stuck somewhere in his quiver. Uh, that wasn't going to do it. I wanted them to be able to recognize it at a glance. The other change that I made was that I wanted to do uh, stories that were very much uh, out, out of the real world. A majority of my stories were taken from headlines, uh, things that, that were in the news. Uh, but in the case of the Longbow Hunters, I jumped the gun by six months. I, I featured a, 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 as a, one of the elements had to do with the CIA involved in a drugs for guns scam. And Six months after the book appeared, I get a phone call from a New York radio station wanting to know how I got the story ahead of everybody else. And I said, look, reality is I came up with that story a year before anybody else. The, the book just appeared six months before that story broke. And I said, all I did was I, I looked around, took the, the various characters, um, plug them into this scenario and I said, okay, what would be the stupidest thing these guys could possibly do if they were absolutely certain they'd never get caught? And that's what I wrote. <laughs> and now thinking back on thinking back on it now, uh, I do know that the, the NSA has readers whose job it is to read everything before it gets into print. And because there was a six month lead on the uh, on the uh, Longbow Hunters from the, the first issue in, until the last. I mean, uh, all that stuff had to be in six months in advance. It's entirely possible that one of these NSA guys reads, the, reads by a, an advanced copy of Longbow Hunters and goes down the hall and knocks on Ollie North's door and says, Ollie, I got an idea for you. You're going to love this. 
possible. <laughs> I, I don't think that that's really what happened, but but it's possible. Uh, the other changes that that I made um, had to do with turning the character into the kind of person that would enable me to do the kind of stories that I wanted to do. Denny had already uh, done a story where Ollie accidentally shoots a guy, kills him, and goes off his nut. Um, joins a monastery, um, swears that he'll never take another human life, withdraws from society and everything else. And um, I, I couldn't do the kinds of story that I wanted to do and have that be part and parcel of the character. So in order to bring about that change, I set up a scenario where Dinah Lance is in mortal danger. And there's a moment where Ollie has to make a choice. Uh, I had already demonstrated that he has the uh, ability to shoot a knife out of a guy's hand. Easy for him. But in that moment of decision, he chose not to shoot the knife out of his hand. He shot him through the heart. Why? Because the son of a bitch deserved it. That's, that's number one. But also <laughs> because that, that moment of choice would change the character fundamentally so that I could continue that aspect of, of the, the story that I wanted to pursue where even Robin Hood killed bad guys. I mean, that's all there was to it. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, take him into that hard edge realm that you know, eventually spilled into uh, the Arrow TV series. It just fit with the kinds of stories that I wanted to do. And as for the as for the uh, violence that was portrayed in that book, I had uh, a young artist. Um, I won't mention his name because he went on to draw a book that was so violent and so bloody that was it was hysterical because uh, he um, accosted me at the Chicago Comic Con and said, "You know, Grell, excessive violence isn't uh, good storytelling. It's just laziness." I I went, no, wait a minute, hang on, come back here. Let's let's talk about this. I said, what is it that you don't don't like about Longbow Hunters? He said, I hated that you showed Dinah Lance being raped. I went, whoa, where did you read that? Because in the book, nobody rapes her. She's never raped. Um, the only person who touches her at all now, when when Ollie finds her, she's hung up from a forklift and she has been beaten. And her clothes are mostly off, but um, there's that's neither here nor there. And he said, "Well, I hated that you showed her being slugged in the face." I said, "I never showed her being slugged in the face. She's got the bruises, but the only person who touches her in that book is the bad guy with a knife who has her by the hair one second before Ollie's arrow goes through his heart, and he he kind of." Not, had to nod and agree that yeah, he had misread all of that stuff. And I'm, I, I can't tell you how many people have read the absolute worst into it. So as, as part of the storyline, because I, I, I believe that your characters, if, if they're going to have depth and dimension, you can't pass off serious acts that or incidents that occur in their lives. They have to have some continuing meaning. And as a result of this incident with Ollie and Dinah, they go through uh, a period where, number one, she can't stand to be touched. Mm -hmm. That's that's normal, but they, they had gone from having probably the best sexual relationship in comics at the time. They were in and out of bed all the time, uh, even under Denny's watch. Uh, and And that was... That was a given. They're living together. That's all, that's all there is to it. Um, and from Ollie's standpoint, I compared it to uh, standing on the edge of a cliff and jumping off. You can't change your mind. You can't unjump. You can't call back the arrow. You make your decision in the moment, and then you live with, it, with the aftermath of it. And it continued to affect them throughout their their relationship until they found a way to mutually put it behind them and and that to me is the uh the genuine uh 
crux of the, the whole story. My whole run on Longbow Hunters on, on Green Arrow, um, there were individual stories, but really the overall arc is the love story between Ollie and Dinah. Yeah, I mean, it still is one of my favorite runs in comics. I have the, the complete run, and that's something that always stood out to me was it was about the character. It wasn't about the heroics, the superheroes. At the heart, it was about Ollie and Dinah. I, you know, one thing that also I think was interesting in your run, because it's it goes for years, is you didn't connect it to the DC universe, really. Right. It's own thing. It was separate. And... I think it, it probably could appeal to people that don't necessarily want to read superhero stories, but they want to read a story like this. And, and I think that it was a very interesting turn that you took for him, considering that, like you said earlier, he was partnered with Green Lantern for so many years. So what, what about that or why, what was the decision behind that to like, I'm going to separate it completely from DC, from the overall DC universe. You put him into a real town, into Seattle. It wasn't into a fictional town like Metropolis or Gotham. Like, no, he's in Seattle, Washington. This is where he is. And no superheroes in there. I mean, I know there were some crossovers and annuals, but other than that, it was, that was it. The, the reason for that was that in order to establish that he was in the real world dealing with real world issues, I felt that it was absolutely necessary that there are no no superheroes, no such thing as superheroes. Now, as far as mystical things goes, mystical things happen all the time. Supernatural things happen all the time around the world to people on a, you know, a, a daily basis. Somebody has some kind of a supernatural mystical experience. And I'm not saying that that, that isn't the real thing, but there's no superheroes in skin tights, uh, suits flying around with a magic ring or anything like that. And so even when I brought Hal Jordan into the story, it was as Hal. It wasn't as Green Lantern. It was as Hal. As, as for the, the why I was able to uh, get away with it was years ago, I've, I was in the offices at DC, and uh, Elliot Magan was in talking to Julie Schwartz. And Elliot says, okay, so... We know that Superman has drilled through the center of the earth and come out the other side. So why didn't he discover Scartaris while he was down there? So you, we have, you know, what, what planet is Scartaris on? And Julie said, at DC, we have Earth-1, Earth-2, Earth-Prime, and earth Grell." And Elliot says, what's on Earth, Grell? And Julie said, him. <laughs> in, other, in other words, he's off in his own little world. And, and I was. And, and uh, I, I make no bones about it that uh, I, it's, uh, in fact, a certain source of pride to me that when I've gone in and taken over a, a series like Iron Man, I didn't pay that much attention to continuity I, I i took the character in my own direction and and built stories that i wanted to tell about the kind of characters that that i wanted to see and uh, by by ignoring uh established continuity um or in in fact it was that was also in the days before everybody had to have that integrated continuity where everything was so tightly entwined that if you missed one issue of one book out of the entire publication run for that month, you couldn't understand any of the story, which is what happened with uh, Valiant Comics. You know, their, their first six months, their sales were just gangbusters, but some of their books were not particularly popular. And because their continuity was all tied up, as soon as somebody skipped buying one issue, they found that they couldn't understand the, the entire story arc anymore. I, I think that that was, that was lucky for me that at the time I had the support and backing of everybody on down the line from my editor to the publisher. Um, at one point when Dan Jurgens was drawing the book, I wrote a story uh, 
for Green Arrow, where it, it deals with, uh, based on a true story about a, a biker gang from uh, Canada who sold a girl into the sex trade, sold her across the border to a gang in Florida. And when she tried to, tried to break away, they crucified her as a lesson. Uh, I did I did that story, and when um, Mike Gold saw the script, he took it to Dick Giordano, who was inking the book at the time, uh, over Dan Jurgens' pencils. And Mike says, okay, I need your advice on this. What do you think we should do? And Dick said, push it. In other words, push the envelope. And we did. And I got you know, all kinds of flack for that. Uh, but it also got me mentioned, okay, not me per se. They mentioned the comic. They never mentioned my name in print, damn it. But it was, it was written up by the New York Times and Time Magazine in the same week. The, the best review ever in the history of reviews. They called it uh, borderline pornography pandering to the prurient interest of today's youth. Like, oh man, but they did but they didn't use use my name. Now Mindy Newell, who was writing Catwoman at the time, they mentioned her name big time. Mindy's dad was a heavy hitter stockbroker on Wall Street. Uh, the company had I don't know how many floors of one of the big buildings, so right there on Wall Street. And she gets a phone call when that article came out and um she, it was her dad, and she was just dreading this conversation. Mindy, this is Daddy. He'd like to come down to my office for lunch today. And she's like, oh, my God. What's going to happen now? She steps off the uh, elevator into the lobby of the offices, and there on the wall opposite is the that page from the Times blown up wall size with her name circled about 50 times in a yellow highlighter, and she gets a standing ovation. Her dad comes out, hands her a bouquet of roses and says, honey, I've been on Wall Street for 35 years and never had my name in the Times. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I do want to like touch on your Iron Man stuff. But before that, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of your other um, creator own stuff. You did John Sable. Yep. You, you did Star Slayer. I was wondering if you could touch on that. And then also, while you're talking about that, I want to hear – the story behind Shaman's Tears at Image and what that was like during the craziness of the of the 90s when Image like broke off and you decided to put out a book through them as well. As I said, uh, Savage Empire, uh, which became the Warlord, uh, was originally intended to be a creator owned. And after I had had made my bones in the business, I was approached first by Pacific Comics. I had done a, a portfolio for them, and uh, they had put two and two together and realized that you can make money publishing comics yourself. They offered me creator ownership and a royalty, which that was it as far as I was concerned. Um, I was the, the first artist to sign with them. Jack Kirby was the second. Jack's book came out ahead of mine because Jack could probably draw five pages while we've been talking here. And uh, Neil Adams was the third to sign with him. Um, Jack's book came out first, mine came out second uh, for six issues. I think Neil brought out two issues of Ms. Mystic and uh, something happened there. Um, but then um, beyond that, um, Mike Gold, who had been with DC Comics. This was prior to the, the Longbow Hunters, long before Longbow Hunters, uh, phoned me up and said, um, we're forming a company here in Chicago called First Comics, as in First Comics, then Drugs, then the babysitter winds up in the freezer. He said, uh, um, we would like you to come and work for us. And here's the thing, you own it. Lock, stock, and barrel. We just want to publish it. We'll pay your royalty. We'll pay your page rate. Carte blanche. Anything you want to do. Any character you want to do. And that was that was a godsend. I had been getting real tired of superheroes and muscle-bound characters and stuff like that. 
and I wanted to do um, something that was uh, a little closer to my old Iron Mike comic strip, a uh, hard-boiled private detective kind of thing. But I also knew that in order to bring that about at my best level of work, I have to be able to do stories that interested me and subject matter and settings that I was interested in. I've always felt a keen uh, attraction to Africa. Growing up in northern Wisconsin in an area that was ranked tied for first among the most depressed areas in the United States, tied with Appalachia. If your dad didn't hunt, the family didn't eat meat. And in in my case, you know, I, I grew up with uh, hunting as a, a tradition in the family. And you, know, you carried on through with the archery and all that other stuff. Um, I wanted to be able to incorporate all that and do the kinds of stories that would bring out the best in me. And so I, I created the John Sable character, uh, who is a, a former um, hunter and game warden in Africa whose family is wiped out by poachers. And um, he goes off his nut, hunts them down, and slaughters them in the most horrific ways, and then gets thrown out of the country, deported back to the United States. And the, the key to this character is that he's a drunk with a death wish. But if all you have to live for is vengeance, what do you do when your vengeance is done? He becomes, uh, like I said, a, a drunk with a death wish. He's, he's fashions himself as a mercenary because really at the heart, he's looking for somebody else to put a bullet in and put him, put him out of his misery. But along the way, he starts writing these children's books uh, based on stories, bedtime stories that he had told his own children. And it's about a troop of leprechauns living in a pheromone in Central Park. And uh, he goes under the pen name of B.B. Flem, F-L-E-M-M. -M. When it's written out, it doesn't look bad, but when you say it, it's like really horrible. Like nobody would pick that. And unfortunately for him, uh, they become so popular and he starts making so much money at it that he doesn't want to give that up, but now he's stuck. Uh, there's, he doesn't have any secret identity. There's none of this by day, the mild mannered children's author by night, the dark Avenger or anything like that. Uh, everybody knows he's Mr. Blood and Guts. Uh, but they don't know that he has this gentle side, uh, this this um, um, soft side. So when he has to do a personal appearance, that's when he puts on a disguise. A Harpo Marx wig and nerd glasses and tweed jacket. It goes under the name of B.B. Flem. Um, when ABC optioned it for a very short-lived TV series, mercifully short, um, they went, no, 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 you got it all wrong. See, by day, he's a mild-mannered children's author, and by night, he's the Dark Avenger. My, my concept was the reverse of Batman. So they reversed my reverse and made it exactly like Batman. Uh, and it was canceled after the second episode was on the air, I'm pretty sure, maybe after the first commercial ran, the, the network phoned up and said, for God's sake, don't make any more of this crap. <laughs> but then they had a, I think they had a a, a contract to do uh, six episodes. Some good stuff did come out of that. Uh, everybody who worked on the production, because the production values were extremely high, all the all the tech guys uh, got snapped up right away. Rene Russo and Laura Flynn Boyle both made their acting debuts uh, in the pilot episode. That was ultimately worthwhile there. The next phase of all of that was um, after Long the Hunters and after I had done the James Bond uh, uh, Permission to Die graphic novels, um, Todd McFarlane, uh, I was a kid that I knew uh, when I lived in Idaho. He used to uh, drive down uh, from Canada uh, with his girlfriend, Wanda, in the car. And he was 16 at the time, 17 years old, and uh, come to my studio and we'd sit and talk and showed me his, his samples and I gave him a few uh, tips along the way on what he needed to do with his portfolio 
in order to uh, make the adjustments that he was going to have to have. Um, uh, initially, he couldn't rob buildings with a dam or, or cars. Superheroes was great, right? Which is what most young guys do when they start out. So I, I, I encouraged him to do that. And I encouraged him several uh, other times uh, along his career path. So when he broke away from Marvel and uh, was one of the founders of Image Comics, he phoned me up and said, he wants to come and do a book for us. And that book was Shaman's Tears. It was a, a, a stroke of luck and bad luck. You had good luck and bad luck uh, because we launched it exactly as the industry was collapsing. Exactly. The first uh, issue sold 500 and I think 95,000 copies. Second issue was a quarter of a million. Third issue was 80,000. And by the time we finished the run on the book, which ran uh, 12 regular issues plus one uh, prequel, um, uh, that's numbered zero. And anybody who hasn't read it, when you find that, don't read number zero first. Number zero comes at the end. Or otherwise, there, there's, it, it's a, there's a spoiler in there that will take the, all the sting out of the out of the uh, regular series. But uh, uh, the, the choices that I made for uh, Shaman's Tears was because all my life I had a fascination for Native American culture. Everybody asked me if I have any Indian blood in me. Well, okay. Um, right there and right there, if you can see that, that scar, this one at the base of my thumb. When I was about seven years old, there was a John Wayne movie called Hondo. And in the movie, this young boy who's eight or nine years old and his mother are living on the edge of Apache territory. And one day when the, the war party comes to their ranch, the boy stands up for his mother and he impresses the war chief so much that the chief puts her thumbs together, takes a knife and makes them blood brothers. The blood runs down the hand, right? And every little kid in town had a bandaid on his thumb the next day. And I was, I was dismayed to find out that it didn't turn me into an Indian. I, God, I wanted to be an Indian so bad. About a, a third of my playmates were some uh, Midwestern tribe or the other. And uh, here I am. I was English, Welsh, and Italian. And when I woke up the next morning, I still had blonde hair and blue eyes. I was totally bummed. <laughs> but, yeah, but that but that interest stayed with me all my life. I uh, had the the great fortune uh, working with uh, Doris Leader Charge, who was Kevin Costner's uh, linguistics coach for Dances with Wolves. Um, I tracked her down. She was uh, uh, teaching at a university in the Black Hills, and I uh, called her up. We spent a good long time. Uh, talking and uh, at the end of the day she recommended uh, a stack of books for me uh, on the uh, Indian legends, spirituality, the Lakota language, you know the stuff that was written by or about the the elders in, in the tribes and uh, I had already been well versed in most of that I uh, had a direction that I wanted to go. The reason why the character does this transformation and he comes sort of a superhero version of himself is because superheroes were selling big at the time. And the, and that's the that's the only thing that I regret is I should have followed my first instinct and, and done it to where everything that happens around him is more supernatural and mystical and less the transform into the superhero kind of thing. But as a as a result, I got pretty much rave reviews from all of the Native American community, and uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, greatest compliments I was paid was by a, a guy who's now uh, a good friend of mine, who uh, rode his motorcycle uh, out to Seattle from the Black Hills and uh, uh, rolled into my yard, and he took off his helmet. And I swear to God. He looked like my little brother. 
I mean, he looked, I don't have a little brother, but if I had a little brother, he would look like my little brother. And he said, you know, Mike, you don't have to be an Indian to have an Indian heart. So that's, that's, that's what led on to that. Uh, the, the, um, plot concept for it, for the book, other than the, the Native American aspects and the spirituality, villains of the piece, uh, spun off into their own series called Bar Sinister. Is the Bar Sinister is the mark of the bastard on the, in her, heraldry. Uh, it's that, that red slash across the shield uh, signifying that the, that the person is a bastard. Um, the concept for that came about, again, from a conversation with Mike Gold, but we were just chatting back and forth, and uh, he had a friend who was a, a patent attorney. And I think they were having one of those college type uh, conversations over passing a joint back and forth. And because it, it, it sounds like this, he said, um, tell me, if I were to clone myself, could I patent my clone? And the guy said, yeah, sure. And he said, well, <clears throat> if my clone were to clone himself, could I sue my clone for patent infringement? And that sort of silliness is what led on. Um, and I came up with the concept that uh, these, this company is manufacturing patented life forms, combining human and animal. And you got to remember, this was 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. Science has since caught up, and we do have chimera now on the planet we have we have uh, rabbits that glow in the dark right bunny rabbits that glow in the dark you have uh, uh, human organs like a uh, a pig growing in on the back uh, excuse me a, an ear growing in the back of a pig and in point of fact china has created an embryo that is a chimera of a human and a pig so that it can be harvested for organs for transplant and it's it's downright spooky so um, this this company and and the names of the characters and everything else stem from um, Bat a Batman novel that I picked up off the newsstand one day, and on the back cover blurb, every time it said Batman, there was a a copyright symbol and a TM mark. Gotham's copyright TM, the Joker copyright TM, DC blah 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 blah, and if you read that. In the process, it was came out like gibberish, but so I named this this company this genetics lab, Circle C Laboratories, which is the copyright symbol. The the two villains who run it are uh, an Air Force general by the name of General Patrick Pat Pending, and uh, a Russian rogue scientist by the name of Dr. Regis Patoff, registered U.S. Patent Office. And then the, the lead character in Shaman's Tears is named Joshua Brand. Brand being, you know, or, or his, it's a brand name, right? What's your brand name? Brand. There you go. Um, his blood brother is Tom Broad Arrow, which is the British uh, symbol for trademark. Uh, and the various creatures, the, the um, human-animal combined creatures, are named things like Banner, docket, tartan, sigil, signet, tally, uh, blazon, you know, all, all things that refer back to uh, a copyright or a trademark of, of some sort. And I'm, I'm a little bummed that nobody twigged to that because that was, that was one of my best jokes of all time. I guess maybe the joke was on me uh, be, because I was sure that someone would spot that, but uh, I've had to actually speak about it before people would go oh yeah oh yeah i get it now oh well the nature of all of that is that um this this process of uh evolving characters from other books th that sometimes they take on a life of their own uh i spun uh maggie the cat off from the sable series uh she was a the the first person he encountered who kicked his ass and she continued to outsmart him every time 
they ran into each other. And uh, I always got a kick out of it, uh, the idea that the hero is always, always supposed to come out on top. Well, not in this case. She's got the edge on him. She's smarter than him. She's craftier than him. And, and uh, ultimately, uh, she always winds up getting her way. Um, we did a, a Kickstarter last year and uh, relaunched that book. It had, it had run at the tail end of the Shaman's Tears book. When we realized that, man, everything was going to hell in a handbasket. And the kinds of books that were selling at the time were female-centric heroes, um, action, uh, female action heroes. Uh, so uh, we launched Maggie the Cat, got two issues out before I cracked the books one day and realized that I had been losing $4,000 a month publishing comics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I can't afford a, a $4,000 a month hobby. It's It was just just terrible. So um, I, I pulled a pin on Maggie after two issues. So last year I went back and we ran a Kickstarter and uh, we're lucky enough to raise enough money to uh, do not only those two issues in a single volume, but to add 15 pages of new art that expanded the story and uh, made it a lot better. In the meantime, I had uh, written a, a screenplay and now the, the comic tracks the screenplay um, as, as opposed to the other way around. And we're going to be doing another uh, Kickstarter for Maggie here in the not too far distant future. But first, we're going to be launching uh, a Kickstarter to do uh, uh, an oversized omnibus edition of John Sable Freelance. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. 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 And, and uh, uh, in, in order to uh, finish it all out, uh, what, what it's going to have, it's going to be it's, it's going to be hardcover dust jacket uh, uh, available initially. Eventually, perhaps we'll go into uh, a trade size volumes, but they're uh, each one is going to be about 500 pages, and we'll uh, bring those out over the next two years through my master master stroke comics imprint and um, hopefully finish them up with the last one coming out on my 75th birthday. That's awesome. Close, that. Closer than you might think. It's only two years away. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I, I mean, I, I'm super stoked. I love that uh, creators are able to put stuff out themselves through Kickstarter. I think it's awesome and that we get projects that maybe publishers wouldn't necessarily fund to get made and now we get to get, and I love hardcovers. So like you're, you're speaking right to me, man, with, with these John Sable hardcovers. I can't wait to get in on that. Yeah, it's, it, it's going to be great. One of the things that, that I've discovered over the last couple of years is that because of crowdfunding, guys are able to get projects done that they would never get past a, a, a major publisher. Uh, I personally had a pitch in front of DC for three years waiting for an answer. And it finally came back, no. At the same time that Dan DiDio well, was telling me, no, we're not gonna do it. Uh, he was complaining that young writers today don't know how to tell a story in three acts. It's like, Dan, I'm standing right here. Right? Okay, I'm standing right here. And he just he just uh, uh, wandered off and kind of muttered to himself. And so as, a, as a, an end result is that I had built up enough frustration. I had a, a couple of buddies, uh, Jeff Messer, uh, who's now editor-in-chief over at, at my uh, Masterstroke imprint, and Arvell Jones. Uh, who had been hounding me for over a year, both of them over a year, to do a Kickstarter, do a Kickstarter. And finally, with their help, uh, I was able to get that thing launched and was surprised at the, at the end result. And now when I hear that with, uh, with uh, COVID uh, in the world, 
and all the conventions are shutting down, people are really hungry for that next comic product. And guess what? All their money that they had been spending on conventions, now they're soaking it into um, backing projects, backing comic projects that they really believe in on Kickstarter and um, buying original art hand over fist. Uh, I've got a commission list. Okay, it was not as long as my arm, uh, but it was really long when um, I think mid July, and it's taken me this long to whittle that down to where right. I've, I've got maybe six or eight on the list. And uh, uh, these people are they're happy to spend their money somewhere, and mm -hmm. they might as well spend it on me. That that's like one of my goals is to get a Green Arrow piece from you sometime in the future. It it would it would probably be uh, cheaper than you expect un until I get old and creaky. I'm old, but I'm not creaky yet. Um, I, I told uh, uh, I told my art rep Scott Cress at uh, CatskillComics.com um, that as soon as I'm dead, I'm doubling all my prices. <laughs> really? So you know, better better get in while the while the getting's good. Uh, yeah. No, if you go if you go to CatskillComics.com. Uh, there's a there's a page for my art, and you'll see what the rates are. Um, Scott is set up to take plastic of all sorts. If you wanted to put it on a credit card, you could. Yeah, that okay. that's not a that's not a problem. And then that way, it's not like you're spending real money. See, you don't need to sell me on it though, because like like I said, uh, that's one of my that's one of my goals, like more so than getting like an expensive comic. I want original art from artists that I admire and that I love and a green arrow piece by you would just be like icing on the cake. You know what I mean? Um, there you go. I see you got some great stuff on your wall in the background. That's my wife's uh, art actually. Yeah. She loves, wow. yeah, she loves animals. She's an amazing artist. I mean, you can't see it, but in front of me, I'm also staring at another seven canvases that are lining the wall. Wow, nice stuff. Thank you. I'll, I'll let her know. Uh, it's not the first time somebody's complimented that, uh, and I can't take credit for it. But um, yeah. No, I've, I've been, yeah, I've got to kind of strain my eyes in order to make out what it is, but uh, I've always been uh, very strongly drawn to wildlife art myself, which is one of the reasons why Sable and why Shaman's Tears I get to draw all kinds of great critters. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's something that I, it draws me, like you talked about um, Native American culture, like that's something that always has been very interesting to me. My wife loves Native American culture, and nature is just like something that really like pulls her in, so like that's where I think her best work shines, is when she's doing stuff like she paints Yosemite, or we went yep. to Zion, and she's done stuff like that. And I'm like right now, I'm looking at a deer, a bear, and a cougar to my right, um, the one, ah, there you go. The ones you're looking at, uh, she's got the wolf right there and then an owl. And then I can't remember. I think there's a Joshua tree painting right behind me too as well. So, but I, I kind of want to jump back to before we uh, wrap it up, I wanted to ask about Iron Man. You, you wrote a run on Iron Man and you also had him reveal his identity to the world. Yes. In that comic book. Um, I don't. Yeah, and then I got fired. I mean, that's, but I mean, I don't think very many people really realize that, like, you are responsible for that. And that's huge. You've, his secret identity is gone. And I think that a lot of people overlook that. I wanted to ask you, what was the thought process, or not, not thought process, what was the idea behind that? Why did you decide to have him reveal his identity? I, I had, I had a problem. Um, with the, the general concept uh, to, to begin with and how it had changed over the years. Um, uh, originally, uh, Tony Stark was this, he's, he's a scientist and he's got a bad heart and it's the suit that keeps him alive, right? It's that energy that, that keeps him alive. And over the years, the Iron Man suit had become so all powerful. It was like Superman. Um, he's in the suit, not only did did he wear the suit but his body assumed the shape of the suit you know after a few years 
Tony Stark had shoulders bigger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, <laughs> his head was as big as his fist, and his neck tapered up from his shoulders uh, to the, the point of his head. It's like, yeah, this is going to fool a lot of people, right? I, I, I did a couple of things uh, with it, and, and one of them was I uh, went back to the concept that the suit had to be charged every 24 hours. Um, I, I slimmed him down, made him more an ordinary guy you know, physically. The idea that the suit had to be charged every 24 hours, I added an element and added an element in there where he could also use his heart energy to power the suit. If it if the suit had gone basically gone dead, he could use the heart energy to power the suit which lent an air of self-sacrifice, okay? Uh, one, of the, one of the things about the Superman that I, I ne never cared for is he's invulnerable, indestructible. You, you can't hurt him, you can't harm him, so you have to harm the people around him, right? Uh, but as, as far as the character himself goes, meh, uh, who cares? Uh, with, with Tony Stark, uh, I... I focused on the man inside the iron. You know, the iron is just the shell that it protects him from the outside world, but it also isolates him from the outside world. You know, he's, it's, a, it's a hard shell that it's difficult to get through. Um, and I, I, I didn't arbitrarily reveal the secret identity. I discussed it with the editor and it went back and forth with the publisher and finally it was agreed that yeah this would this would be a good story well how i did it how i chose to do it was that um you know tony's always been in love with pepper but pepper's married pepper's married to happy hogan because tony can't get close to anybody and and so he he essentially pushes her into Happy's arms. As a result of that, he's got this bittersweet idea that, man, oh man, you know, could have been what could have been, what should have been. And then Pepper gets pregnant. And as a result of something that Stark does, she winds up being beaten badly and loses the baby. At that point is where uh, you come to the scene where Stark is at a press conference, uh, Stark Industries, and they're up, you know, six, eight, ten floors off the off of the street and um, out on the patio. And down below, there's a robbery going on. And in the path of the getaway car, there's a little boy and his dog. The dog breaks away, uh, runs out into traffic. Uh, Stark sees what's happening, and he doesn't hesitate. Over the edge of the railing, he goes. The armor comes around him, and he smashes the car to a halt. And all of his friends are pissed off big time. It's like, you bastard, you kept this secret from us all these years, and you reveal it for a dog? And Stark goes, no, I didn't do it for the dog. I did it for him. He points to the little boy. That's the the heart and soul of the character uh, in that moment, and what what caused the big rift, uh, and and one of the reasons why uh, Marvel tried to sort of sweep that story under the rug and kind of forget that it ever happened, um, was that the fans were in uh, two factions. The really vocal faction hated the idea that he would reveal his identity that way. They felt that it should be something cataclysmic, monumental. An asteroid is about to smash into the earth or something like that. And he would have to reveal his identity in order to do that. And uh, again, I, I took it the opposite direction and focused on the man, not the suit. Focused on the man and made it as human as possible. And um, the the letters started pouring in, pouring in, and as a result, my editor, my publisher, had a big argument over it in the 
in the hallway at Marvel one day, and the next thing I knew, I was out of a job. My my editor was a hundred percent in my corner, uh, but you know he was he was outshouted or outvoted somewhere along the line, and my moment of vindication was Robert Downey Jr. standing up at the end of Iron Man and going like, I'm Iron Man. <laughs> like, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I loved your time on Iron Man. Iron Man is, I think, I think more so as, as like with the movies has become so, so beloved, you know, like I think that um, whereas before he was looked at maybe like a B-list character, I guess, from the outside, you know, looking in, yeah. I think that um, he's he's now A-list. Right? Everybody knows who Iron Man is, and I too, I love that scene when he says, "I'm Iron Man." I just watched it with my uh, daughter. Um, she hasn't seen it; she had seen other movies, but I watched it with her yesterday, and she absolutely loved that movie. Um, ah, cool. Yeah. So I, when they when they first cast it, when they first cast it, um, uh, somebody asked me, "What do you think of the idea of Robert Downey Jr. doing the role?" I went. It's going to be phenomenal if they give him a good script, right? Uh, and they did. I did. It was it was so smart and so funny. But I was trepidatious because I saw what happened with the Hulk. Yeah. You know, uh, once once he turned into the Hulk, it was like watching a video game and not a very good video game. But uh, Iron Man took all of that away, and you never lost track of the fact that Stark was inside that suit because it would take you inside the helmet, even though the the characters are flying around on the right. edge of space and everything else. They they take you inside the suit as a reminder. No, this is this is him. And the 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 overall storyline it was it was well thought out and like I said, just hysterically funny. The dialogue was so snappy. It was like Tracy Hepburn kind of stuff. <laughs> um, it it was it was it was extra good because they didn't pause for the laugh. Right, they didn't right. wait for the laugh. They just went on to the next thing, and if you didn't catch it, but somebody else in the audience was laughing, you would probably want to come back and watch it again and find out why they were laughing, and then you get all the jokes. It, it, it was. It was. I think it, it. It set off. I mean, look what it set off. Right, Iron Man was a catalyst yeah. for everything that Marvel did, and right. and uh, that was the formula, man. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. Um, from his first movie appearance as Iron Man to his final scene in Endgame, I mean, he was just absolutely phenomenal. I do want to talk about, uh, you know, we lost Danny O'Neill this year, and yes. I know that you've you've obviously had a relationship with him during your time at DC. I was wondering if you could share your favorite Denny story with us. Favorite Denny story, man. There's there's a bunch of them. Uh, he was one of the first people that I met when I started at DC Comics, and I was so much of a fanboy. I don't even remember what I said. I think I probably drooled on his shoes a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I was lucky enough to be in the offices at uh, DC Comics when um, I think it was Curry Bates came down the hall and said, Denny's going to resurrect Green Lantern Green Arrow. And I went straight to his office and I said, who do I have to kill? And then he said, just put the gun down and the job's yours. No, actually, I had, I had, had a, a, a bit of a track record with both of the characters separately doing backup stories. Uh, but but it, was, it was Denny who, who made that possible. Uh, he, he jumped in uh, into my corner and... Um, um, back me for the job, and the next thing I know, I'm doing my my dream job in comics. The, the, that the comic book that had gotten me interested in comics was the one that I was going to be drawing. It was just amazing. And then being able to come full circle with him um, for the 80th anniversary of Green Lantern, uh, he wrote a story and specifically requested me for that story and it was an honor um a, a, a big thrill to to go back and do that one more time and 
when I was drawing the the last page, I flipped through the script and I noticed that in the final panel, Denny had written the end. And right then I knew that he knew something. And sure enough, you know, just a matter of weeks later he's gone. But he's always going to be in my heart. He's always always going to be one of my biggest heroes. I learned more about how to write a good story by drawing Denny's stories than anything else. He used to say, um, one of my all-time favorite, favorite quotes is that there are no hard and fast rules. So here are the hard and fast rules. Uh, he'd, he'd say no more than, no more than uh, 12 words in a balloon, no more than 100 words on a page. And, you know, he'd be the first one to break the rules. But he said, you have to know the rules in order to break them, right? In, in order to know what you're doing when you, when you break them. And then uh, the other favorite one was when, when somebody would uh, try to argue him down and say, look, this, this couldn't work, this couldn't work, this couldn't work, or whatever. Then you look him dead in the eye and you say, yes, it's bullshit science, but it's our bullshit science. And, and, and that, that does make sense. Uh, uh, it, it's called uh, internal logic uh, in, in your story. You create the internal logic and you sell that and you stick with it no matter what. And eventually the audience will come along with you. Like uh, the movie uh, Casablanca um, uh, at, at the start, it talks about uh, the letters of transit that can't be rescinded because they're, signed by some French general, excuse me, the, the, the Nazis are in control in France. You think they're going to listen to what some French general puts on paper, but they, but they established that it can't be rescinded. So whoever has these letters, they're free to go. It's just, it's bullshit science, but it's their bullshit science. I, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow stuff may have come out before I was born, but it still resonates to this day. And I think that's the power of a good writer that can um, kind, of, kind of transcend a time period. While some of that stuff you could say is dated, the themes and what he talked about are so relevant to this day. And it's still one of my favorite stories, you know, was that. Yeah, some of them even more so. Yeah. yeah some of them even more so. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, he is just an amazing editor, amazing writer, everything that he did in comics. And it was, it was a sad day for, for everybody that knew him and then everybody that was a fan of him as well. So thank you for sharing, um, you know, a couple of memories uh, with us. And before we get out of here, I know you kind of touched on a couple of Kickstarters you got going on. I was wondering if you could um, tell us of any other projects you're working on, maybe if it's for DC, anything you can tease or besides the Kickstarter. Well, one one of the one of the uh, projects that uh, is has launched already, uh, funded, completed, and in fact, it's uh, shipping out to the backers. I think on Tuesday uh, is called the Pilgrim, uh, which is a story that my uh, all-time best buddy Mark Ryan uh, came up with. Told me this story. Uh, around a campfire about 20 years ago, or probably somewhere up in the mountains. And uh, it's about, uh, uh, based on a program that the British government had uh, running during World War II, where they were, uh, it was called, uh, let's see, what was it called? The U.S. had a program called Operation Stargate that uh, they were using psychics to see if they could spy on the enemy. And one of the things that they were trying to do was to create an entity, to manifest an entity out of pure mental energy. And the, the story goes that during one of these sessions, they got something. And the house was bombed during the London Blitz and this entity winds up escaping out into the world. And then you fast forward into the, the present day and it's still here. It's been wandering around all this time trying to figure out uh, almost like a Frankenstein monster. 
of who am I, what am I, what's my purpose, where am I going? And um, we did, uh, uh, we're uh, doing a, a, a special volume uh, that combines the first two issues. And then Mark has already written the follow on for that. And in fact, it's in development as a, a television series right now. I wish I could say I created it because that, that would be really great. But no, that, that's all, all Mark Ryan. Mark is the guy who did the voice of uh, uh, Jetfire and Bumblebee and uh, Lockdown in the uh, Transformers movies. Oh, cool. Also starred in Black Sails, Robin of Sherwood. Uh, he created the uh, Arab character in Robin of Sherwood, the very first Arab character ever in that legend after like, you know, 1200 years he comes along and creates a character and now you never see a Robin Hood story without without uh, uh, an Arab type character in it I have a I have a a, a novel uh, okay I'm I'm uh, revising and we're going to be bringing out the Sable novel again as part of a promotion uh, that'll be available as an ebook and uh, then in a, a print volume as well. Um, and I have a, a spin off from that. And I have um, uh, my Savage Empire has uh, grown into a novel now. And uh, it, it's, it's almost ready for its bar mitzvah. I got a few more, I got a few more pages to go. Um, and uh, that's going to be uh, part of a, a hopefully uh, a three part series uh where i go back and deal with this guy who plunges through the time warp into atlantis um as he's really curious about what happened to atlantis and you know ultimately it's going to turn out that well he probably had something to do with that <laughs> in in one fashion or another uh, but that's all that's all uh, um, stuff that's that's ongoing here and uh I could uh, uh, keep you for days on, on stuff that's still um, locked away inside the computer or locked away in here. I just hope I get the chance to do it all. Uh, if not, I'll leave something behind. I mean, I, I, I'm definitely looking forward to all these projects. Uh, Kickstarters, super stoked on. Can't wait to hear more about that when they uh, launch. Um, but where can people find you? Where can we find out when these things are going to be launched? MikeGrell.com. Okay. There you go. Uh, yep, MikeGrell.com. Uh, also, there is a uh, an authorized uh, Mike Grell Facebook page. Okay. Uh, it, it's actually uh, moderated by uh, Jeff Messer, who's, the, the again, the editor for uh, my Masterstroke Comics imprint. The uh, website itself, I have no idea how to get to it because, honestly, don't like Facebook. I don't blame you. Okay, cool. Well, I, um, this is a perfect place to, to wrap it up. Again, I wanted to thank you so much for doing this today. Huge privilege and honor to be able to sit here and chat with you. Um, I will throw all the links for everybody watching or listening. I will throw all the links down below uh, to where you can find uh, Mike and his stuff. And uh, yeah, this is super fun, dude. And I hope we can do this again sometime. Great. Awesome. All right. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Ryan. All right, bye. Cheers.